was planning its own secret weapon, a stealth submarine that could launch specialized bombers, blow up the Panama Canal, and attack U.S. cities. Just about all Japanese air missions were being flown as kamikaze missions, and the plan was to do the same here. Japanese super sub on Secrets of the Dead. Secrets of the Dead was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Spring, 1946. Ten months after the end of World War II, an explosion rocked the Pacific off the coast of Hawaii. America had just destroyed one of Japan's most advanced weapon systems. I was a lookout. When I got to look through the periscope, it was a monster, believe me. Rather than a belated attack against the defeated Japanese, the sinking of this top secret submarine was a preemptive measure for the looming Cold War, a brazen decision by the Americans to keep the sub out of Soviet hands. The plan worked, and the weapon lay undisturbed at the bottom of the ocean for six decades. Until a team of underwater explorers from the University of Hawaii located its remains. The discovery sparked a new examination of the long forgotten super sub. It can go, go around Cape Horn, it can go around the Cape of Good Hope. 37,000. That's miles. right, this that gave you doing. enormous strategic options. You could basically attack anywhere in the world. This was a global weapon system. A system that defied conventional design and married the tactical advantages of sea and sky. As America scrambled to build nuclear bombs and Germany experimented with powerful rockets, Japan hoped its secret weapon would change the course of the war. Six months before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Imperial Navy dominated the Pacific. The Japanese strike in December 1941 because they see it as a window of opportunity. And Japan temporarily has the most powerful navy in the Pacific. Let's cash that in. The Japanese plan was simple. Hit hard and knock the Americans off balance. They believed this would force an American retreat, leaving Japan as the sole superpower in the region. The architect of Japan's Pacific strategy was Harvard-educated Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto. Yamamoto had mixed feelings about the campaign. In terms of his own personal opinions, he was very much against a war with the United States, which he felt was uh, essentially unwinnable. But at the same time, in his capacity as uh, commander-in-chief of the uh, combined fleet. He felt he had to come up with some kind of strategy to uh, make a Japanese war in the United States uh, a viable proposition. But nobody realizes more than he how wrong it can all go. That's quite right. And his gambler's instinct tells him that it will have to be very long odds. He wants some capability of, um, say, taking the war to American home waters. Really shock the American populace by some bold gesture. His gesture, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The attack sank five battleships, three destroyers, and several small ships. But the Japanese mistimed their mission because on December 7th, all three American aircraft carriers were at sea and out of harm's way. Japan also miscalculated America's will to fight back. One day after Pearl Harbor, the U.S. declared war against Japan. The fight was on. Both nations scrambled for advantage. The U.S. cranked up its industry 
and relied on its manpower, aiming to overwhelm the Japanese with superior numbers. But for Japan, the challenge was different. Knowing he would soon be outmanned and outgunned, Admiral Yamamoto needed more surgical strikes. In the months following Pearl Harbor, he strategized about how to bring the war across the Pacific to America, 5,400 miles away. He looked to the success of the German U-boats, the deadly Nazi subs that were preying on ships in the Atlantic. From February to May 1942, the U-boats sank 348 vessels, preventing millions of tons of American supplies from reaching Europe. Several of the ships were torpedoed within sight of New York City and Boston. If German subs could terrorize the U.S. East Coast, could Japanese subs do the same in the West? To find out, Yamamoto ordered a series of test missions. He sent a sub to fire shells at a refinery in California. It didn't cause much damage, but did trigger fears of a Japanese invasion. Along the Pacific, the hunt is on for the Jap submarine that brought the war to US soil. Lying offshore, the marauder opened up against oil refineries near the beach at Santa Barbara, a piece of shell made in Tokyo. It did little harm, but it was the first fired in this war against our own shores. The following day, coastal artillery brigades fired at what they thought were enemy planes. The guns were shooting at shadows. No sightings were actually confirmed. But the panicked American reaction did signify to Yamamoto that his instincts were correct. If he could strike the Americans at home, he might make them think twice about an all-out war with Japan. To instill such fear, he would need more firepower than a few small subs could deliver. An aircraft carrier and fleet of bombers would be ideal. But with the US on high alert, no carrier could sneak up on the west coast. Yamamoto needed something unexpected. His solution, a superweapon that would unite the firepower of an aircraft carrier with the stealth of a submarine. If it could be built, his machine would rewrite the rules of warfare. The concept of putting a plane on a sub wasn't new. But conventional submarines of the day were only capable of carrying one small plane for reconnaissance and targeting. Yamamoto wanted sub-launched airplanes that could be used as an offensive weapon, not just a scout. He ordered another test mission. This time, a small submarine-launched aircraft dropped firebombs over Oregon in the hopes of sparking a forest fire. The fire failed to catch, but like the Santa Barbara mission, it confirmed that a submarine could slip past U.S. coastal defenses and strike unsuspecting civilian populations. To be able to reach your destination and launch an air attack, undiscovered, undetected, would give the Japanese an advantage that no other Navy, that no other Air Force had during the war. Yamamoto ordered his engineers to design a fleet of underwater aircraft carriers capable of sailing undetected across the Pacific, launching squadrons of high-tech bombers to attack West Coast cities, then disappearing without a trace. The Admiral even expected his subs to be able to reach the East Coast. He hoped to terrorize America with attacks on New York City and possibly even Washington, D.C. So you've got a whole potential here for attacks in the coastal area, where, of course, a large proportion of the American population is concentrated. That's right. Yeah. New York City, for example. 
dense concentration of population. And if you're attacking with a few tens of aircraft, as mm. in the original plans, you could perhaps go for important communications and indeed iconic targets. The Admiral named the sub the I-400 and declared it top secret. But still to be determined was whether Japanese engineers could bring Yamamoto's ambitious vision to life. Their window for success was a small one. In America, the U.S. had accelerated its own work on a superweapon that could change the course of the war. The effort was codenamed the Manhattan Project. It was headed up by Robert Oppenheimer, a professor of physics at UC Berkeley. Oppenheimer gathered the nation's top engineers and physicists, challenging them to overcome the enormous technical complexities of splitting the atom and creating an atomic bomb. The Americans worked at a furious pace, fearing that the Germans and Japanese were moving forward with nuclear bombs of their own. Meanwhile, Japan's super submarine was running into obstacles. In Tokyo, naval architects were struggling to find a design that could fulfill all of Yamamoto's needs. You're going to need a very large and impressive submarine indeed. You're going to have to go into new territory, in yes, fact, yes. as far as submarine design is concerned. The standard submarine at that time was shaped like a cigar, with a cylindrical hull up to 300 feet long. But no one knew whether that conventional design would be able to support a heavy hangar and three attack airplanes. You're going to need a very large hangar beginning there, moving past the superstructure and ending up about there. What do you do with the navigational area here? You have to move it to the side of the ship and on top as well. So that's a lot bigger. These contain very large aircraft. That's not long enough. So you need a much, much longer flying off deck and therefore you need a much, much bigger submarine. If this is a transformation in the whole concept of the submarine. When we assemble these pieces, we'll end up with a scale model submarine that's about the same as a full-size submarine, which is 10 times longer than it is wide. Dr. Harold Vincent is an ocean engineer at the University of Rhode Island. He has his doubts about the practicality of the design. This tube represents the watertight hangar, the three aircraft, and the bombs that the aircraft carried. So we'll seal off the end of the hangar here. So let's see what happens when we put it in. Okay. Oh, geez, so that tilts right over with that on top. Capsizes right over and sinks. So therefore, they had to come up with some other method to be able to put a heavy hangar with all that aircraft up high. Uh, 